Hi guys, it's me again. Rusty78609 in Central Texas. And uh, this is going to be a, a video about my my Peace Corps experience. Uh, I won't go into it in detail because it'd be too long, but, but I'll just give you an overview of uh, what it's like to, to uh, go through the process of getting into the Peace Corps. And uh, it's probably the same now as it was when I went in. It's been years ago. But again, I'm 70 years old. My channel on YouTube is Rusty78609. And uh, in 1993, after being, I, be, I was married and divorced three times, so you know I'm a super guy. And, uh, oh, I, you know, I, had, I still like all those old gals. But anyway, uh, I just was basically lost, I'll be frank with you. Uh, I didn't know, I, I had been a CPA for about 20 years, and I was no longer interested in it. Uh, I didn't know what else to do. And uh, anyway, one day I was living in an RV at Buckhannon Dam, Texas, in the Highland Lakes of Central Texas. And uh, anyway, I, I uh, again, I was just like wandering in a forest because I had, I didn't know what the hell to do. I couldn't come up with anything. And I was, I had, what had happened was I had been out of public accounting so long, about three or four years, and that I lost, I didn't lose my certification, my CPA certification. I just didn't pay the dues. You know, they were, you know, five, six hundred a year. And then you got to take 50 or 60 hours of continuing education. And that cost you another four or five thousand dollars. You know, I'm not, I wasn't going to spend that because I wasn't using the uh, certification. It, but be that as it may, uh, that year, I don't know how it happened, uh, but I was, I was sitting in my RV there on Lake Buchanan and uh, looking out at the beautiful sunset, and I remembered when I graduated from St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas in 1972, that one of the things I wanted to do, I don't know why, but I wanted to go into U.S. Peace Corps even then. And, uh, but I couldn't because I was married and if to go in as a married couple in the Peace Corps, you both have to have uh, a profession or something that is needed in the country that you're going to. Well, you know, I didn't have that or I, my wife didn't at that time, uh, didn't have, have, have anything. She, that would be, she didn't want to go anyway. And so anyway, that day in 1993, I'm watching the sunset and it occurred to me, I said, you know, I, maybe I could still go in the Peace Corps. I was 49 excuse me, I was 48 years old at that time, 48, and thinking about going in the Peace Corps. But anyway, I got, uh, internet was virtually nothing at that time. And uh, so I went to the library and I found the phone number for the Peace Corps office in Washington, D.C., and I contacted them. It's 1-800-424-8580. <laughs> I still remember that today. 1-800-424-8580. It may have changed. But anyway, so I contacted them. And they sent me, I talked to a girl, a recruiter, I guess, and she sent me a packet of information. And let me tell you, the, the process of getting into the Peace Corps is lengthy. I mean, it, I'm sure it's shorter now because of the Internet and all the other things. But back then, everything was done through the mail, and, you know, that's it. And, again, this was in 1993. And uh, so, anyway, they sent me the packet. You have to have references. you got to get a fingerprinted by the... Uh, police department you got to have an FBI background check uh, they do all kind of background checks on you I don't know what all happens but anyway it takes a year a year because I started the process in uh, May of 1993 May of oh no April of 1993 and by the time they did all the background checks verified all the references and man I'm telling you they really do the references and then you had to do a two-hour uh, uh, phone interview. I believe it was two hours. It could have been one. I think it was two. It was lengthy. It had a lot of questions, a lot of questions. And a, a lot of questions that would throw you off balance, you know, that you never would have thought of in the interview process. But anyway, and I didn't think I was going to get in. I mean, I really didn't. I mean, my background certainly wasn't perfect. I mean, I'd been busted in Victoria, Texas for, what was it, resisting arrest, uh, I got a DW, I had a DWI. Uh, what else did I do? I think I got thrown in jail three times, four times for shit. Oh, I know what I did one time. I hit a police officer. That was great. 
Yeah, that'll get you thrown in jail. But anyway, I, so I didn't think the peace uh, the uh, uh, peace corps would be interested in me at all. But anyway, the process continues, and in March of uh, 2004, uh, I received uh, a letter asking me, you know, which country I was would be interested in. You know, they gave me a couple of choices. And, uh, well, of course, what I didn't realize at that time, it doesn't matter what you're interested in, the country picks you. In other words, they send your information to a country that may use, be, benefit from your, your, your profession or whatever you do. And uh, the, the country looks it over and they say, yeah, we'll t this guy might work out for us. So anyway, that's kind of how that works. So anyway, uh, I, I got uh, a week later, two weeks later, I got a letter back saying that uh, I'd been invited to go to Mongolia. And uh, I didn't even know where it was. I mean, not really. I mean, I'd heard of it, but, you know, I'd heard of Chinggis Khan, but, you know, where in the hell he lived, I had no clue. Uh, but anyway, so I went to the library and immediately started gathering information, reading up on Mongolia and what kind of people they were, what kind of life they were, what the culture was all about. Uh, found out the language was, you know, if you spoke Russian, you could get by pretty good. Uh, you know, they, of course, the Russians use the Cyrillic alphabet, which is, you know, it's backwards. Anyway. Uh, so I started my background, you know, getting ready to go, getting ready to go. And in uh, uh, April of uh, 1994, flew out of uh, Austin to San Francisco. I could be wrong on the date. Maybe it was May. But anyway, flew out to uh, San Francisco and, uh, and, st and we met at the, uh, well, met at the airport. You know, they had the signs and stuff and, and uh, then from there, we were shuttled over to uh, Holiday Inn in Chinatown because the reason we wanted to go to Chinatown was to start our, our uh, act to, to get us used to being in an Asian culture. And believe me, Chinatown is China, period, period. It is just China. That's it. You might as well be in China. And so we stayed there for about a week, I think, maybe less, a few days, several days. With, again, we were at the Holiday Inn, and there were three of us in one room. So God damn you know, couldn't believe it. I guess they were getting us used to living in a dorm or something. But anyway, and they were cool guys. They were younger. I was the oldest volunteer by far. There were 18 of us that went in country together, and uh, I was 48, and the nearest one to me was like 31 or 32. He was an Asian. I may think of his name as we go through here. And uh, uh, Gary Fong was his name, Gary Fong. And he was also in accounting. And I was, uh, my, my uh, duty or my job description in the Peace Corps was small business development and uh, of course I taught accounting at a university in Mongolia while I was there which was interesting and I'm not going to get too much detail on that but anyway so we met in Chinatown we go through these uh, little training sessions and they're giving us some background information I mean you're almost dizzy from all this stuff I mean there you are in Chinatown the culture shock is already hitting you and uh, of course I ordered pizza from North Point Pizza. That's my getting used to culture. Uh, it's be good pizza too, I wanna to tell you. Last good pizza I had for a long time. Uh, but anyway, so then we flew out of San Francisco to uh, Hong Kong. No, wrong, wrong, wrong. We flew from, uh, from uh, San Francisco to Tokyo and we were there for, I don't know, not too long. And, and, and that's a 13-hour flight, folks. I want you to know you get tired of flying. I'm telling you, that is, that's like riding a bus. Anyway, so we arrive in Tokyo. We're there for a few hours. We, I don't even think we left the airport there. And then we uh, went into uh, uh, Beijing, flew to Beijing. We were there for a couple of nights in Beijing at the Moven Pick. I, that's how I pronounce it. That could be wrong. But it was, you know, in central... Uh, uh, Beijing, and at that time, 1994, the, there were very few cars. Now, now it's a thousand times more. I mean, at that time, you could fire a bullet down the street and you wouldn't hit anybody because there were no cars. And you know, the millions of people we hear about are billions. You know, I didn't see any of it. I, I went around and found me some booze and you know checked out. You know, trying to get some bottled water and stuff. Spent a you know walking around a little time walking around in, in Beijing. And I felt perfectly safe. I never felt threatened. You know, you had to get used to 
slipping on slippers to go in your room. I mean, that's one of the things, because you don't wear your shoes in a house. You don't step on the threshold of the entrance. You know, the, the little culture things are starting to filter in. Of course, then you're getting into the food a little bit, a lot of rice. And, uh, and then from there, we flew uh, Miat Airlines from uh, Beijing to uh, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Miat means Mongolian International Air Travel. And believe me, I don't think they, I don't even know if they had seat belts. You know, uh, it was pretty laid back flying. I'm telling you, there were people sitting in the aisle, and you know, I don't know, there might have been a chicken in the aisle for all I know. But we uh, we flew. I was in, I was in shock. You know, my eyes were like, oh no, what have I done? And anyway, you know, and uh, I I was uh, looking out the windows. We're flying over Ulaanbaatar, headed for. I mean, head uh, flying out of Beijing, headed for Ulaanbaatar looking at the countryside, and first thing I observed, there ain't nobody here. I mean, there ain't nothing. I mean, it's just, it's nobody. Every now and then you see these little tent-like things. They call them gares. Uh, the U.S., they call them yurts. Same thing. Uh, and that's what they live in. You know, they're, they're, they're nomadic. You know, they move 16 times a year, 20 times a year. You know, as the grazing runs out, they just put their house on the back of a pickup or a they're animals, and away they go to the next site, kind of like the American Indians did, uh, or the native people uh, did uh, in our country. But anyway, we arrive, in, as we're coming into the airport, I remember coming into the airport in Ulaanbaatar, and I'm looking, I'm starting to see a few houses now, I'm getting my hopes up, everything looked kind of like, it looked like a regular city, a little traffic, you know, they had the electric buses, which was neat. And uh, so anyway, we land at the airport, get out, and we're, we're greeted by the uh, volunteers, some of the volunteers that were in country. Most of them are drunk. And, uh, you know, they're partying, and they're welcoming us and giving us, a lot, giving us a hard time, just like you'd expect them to do. We were basically initiated. And then we were taken out into the, just outside of uh, Ulaanbaatar to what was an old Russian officer's quarters during World War II. And uh, that was our dorm while we were in country. It was two stories. I was on the second floor in a room by myself. Uh, it had There was a restroom way down around the corner. You had to walk about 100 feet to get to the restroom. And believe me, when you have diarrhea and you're hitting the lid about six times a day, restrooms take on a whole new meaning, and so does toilet paper. And... Uh, in this restroom, though, the little the little walls came up to about right here. So, you know, when you when you sat on the lid, you're looking at your buddy next to you. I mean, I thought that was, you sit there and have a conversation while you're taking a crap. Uh, but anyway, that was all part of the culture shock. I mean, things are different here. You know, then you realize that you were in a new world. And then the language, of course, you start hearing the Mongolian language and the Russian language, primarily Mongolian, which is a, a greeting, a hello in in, uh, in uh, in uh, Mongolian is Sambano, which means basically how are you doing, hello, and and uh, it, you, you know they say Sambano, and you say Sang San, that means okay, okay, or good, and then Thai Sambano, that's you know like how are you doing, or and you know it's I, I didn't learn much in language, I wasn't supposed to. They said it wasn't protocol, uh, to, because you know we always had a. a, a a counterpart with us. I mean, I tried to learn the language, and they encourage. They did somewhat encourage us to learn the language because you needed it in any country. You need the language to to buy food and ask where the restroom is and the basic things. And so, you know, I did learn some of those. Do I remember it now? No, that's been God twenty something years ago. Basically, has it been twenty years? Yeah, ninety four. Yeah, over twenty years. So anyway, and then uh, you know, at, we're in the dorm, and you know, we go to these training sessions every day. Uh, at a building called the Children's Palace, which is about two miles away, and you walk through this uh, park. Uh, that was a shortcut to go through the park, and they had a big Ferris wheel there. It was like a carnival, and they had all these characters that looked like Mickey Mouse and, you know, all the Pluto. I mean, all these little characters around big. I mean, they were made out of iron, big metal characters. They had uh, dinosaurs and all kind of stuff that they in the park. And it reminded me somewhat of Disney World. In fact, I made that comment, and my counterpart at that time, Bot Sahan, he said, didn't you know that Walt Disney was from Mongolia? And I said, no, <laughs> I didn't know that. But anyway, uh, so we'd go to the Children's Palace every morning and have breakfast. Breakfast was not much. It was either uh, 
Oh, a uh, hard-boiled egg and some rice. Uh, maybe you get a fried egg. That's it. Not much. I mean, you're. I mean, I I went in country. I weighed about two oh nine, and uh, when I came back uh, several months later, I, I I had a I had to have a root canal, so I ended up getting what they call early term. I was early terminated because you, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Anyway, so you know, you you, you I lost a lot of weight. And that was because of the diarrhea and the fact that you couldn't find food all the time. And it was just difficult. It was, you know, there was a place called the circus market where you could get food and uh, it was okay. You just had to take your own packaging because if you wanted rice, they just scooped it up and you had to have something for them to put it in. They didn't have bags like at HEB uh, and meat. If you want some meat, they, a, a, a crema was a meat uh, that's beef. Uh, and uh, and I'd always go moo beef because I didn't want mutton, you know. And uh, so anyway, they'd cut you a chunk of that and just put it back. You could get it ground up, not there, but there was another place that had a meat grinder. You could take it and get it done so you could make hamburgers and stuff. And I did that occasionally. And uh, and they had, you know, big round, round bread with a big hard crust on it. It was delicious because you could cut off a chunk of that and put that real butter on it and put it in the oven for a minute. Oh, that was that was a whole meal right there. And uh, as far as uh, temperature, you know, during the summer and fall, during the summers, okay, it rained a little bit. Elevation about 5,500, about the same as Denver, Colorado. Mountains all around, about like Denver, Colorado. And uh, snow cap most of the time. The forest around the city. Uh, cattle came right into the town, into the uh, Sukhbatter Square was, you know, again, this is the capital of the country, Ulaanbaatar. And Sukhbatter Square is right in front of the capital. And you know, you'd be there, and there'd be cattle roaming around, or elk, whatever happened to wander into town, and uh, you know they were just as domesticated as a, a pet dog. And uh, you know there was a little restaurant there I used to go to occasionally and sit out and have a beer with some of the people. And there, again, you know the the railroad uh, the, that ca that comes through Ulaanbaatar is the same railroad that you can go up in. It's called the Red Rooster, I think, but it uh, goes from. Uh, from the Russian border all the way through Mongolia to the Chinese border, and uh, then you got to change tra trains, and uh, so you get a lot of tourists coming through from all over the world. I mean, I, and it's all open seating, just like all over Europe. You know, you sit down at a table, and there's two or three chairs vacant, and people sit down, and that's it. They may not even speak your language; doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, so I got to meet people from all over the world, and uh, it was fascinating as hell. I mean, God, I mean, it's like, I mean, I, you're you're so in shock and off balance because you're not hearing English at all, rarely, except from other volunteers. Uh, other than that, you never heard it. And uh, once you get through PST, which is pre-service training, uh, then you're on your own. You go into your apartment. I went into an apartment of what they call a foreigner's building. I was on the eighth floor at an elevator that would hold about five or six people total when it worked which it worked most of the time and it had a, there was a guard. You couldn't just get into the far inner building. You know, you had to go through a guard by a guard gate. And uh, that was nice. I felt a little safe. And, and, and cause the Mongolians can get drunk and they can be a little rough and, they, and they'll think you're a Russian. They'll beat the shit out of you. And so anyway, you'd get on the elevator to go up to the, I'd get on the elevator to go up to the eighth floor and hell, I might hear five, four different languages, you know, Russian, Korean, Chinese, and Mongolian, or no Mongolian, but, you know, every other language in the world, because these other countries were there, you know, of course, after the resources that Mongolia had, you know, they have some oil and gas, not much, they have some metals and ores and stuff that uh, they get, they, they, the, these other countries come in and take away from them. Uh, we're, the U.S. was there, and a company named Knutson was there helping repair the uh, power plants. They have coal-fired power plants, so the air in Ulaanbaatar uh, can be polluted, uh, just like Beijing and China can be, because the coal-fired plants, you know, they don't use scrubbers, you know, they, they, to clean them. They, they, they just, whatever comes out, comes out, and they're not into maintenance. Uh, if it breaks down, it's just the way it is. And uh, so the company... Knutson out of Utah was there to get them on a program of preventive maintenance and upgrade their equipment. And I got to meet those guys at the embassy. And that was interesting too, going to the embassy occasionally and, and watching movies. <laughs> Believe it or not, our embassy charged you 50 cents to come in and watch a movie. Get out of here. All the other embassies, you know, the, the uh, English embassy or from the United Kingdom, 
uh, you know, they had people in country too, similar to the U.S. Peace Corps. You know, everything was free. If they saw their people or their volunteers on the street, they'd pick them up and give them a ride. Uh, you know, you could be out walking somewhere and carrying a pack loaded with books and water, and and our people would just pass you by. I want, I shoot them the finger. Fuck you. You know. Anyway, so that was that's the difference. But uh, the embassy was interesting. You're going and watching the movies and seeing how the embassy works. You know, you had to go through the Marine guards to at the entrance, and they were and they rotated in and out. And I got to meet them at the, what's called the Circle Bar. It was a place where you could go in and drink, you know, Chinese beer, or, you know, whatever, pretty cheap, 50 cents a beer. And I'd go in there every now and then and they were there. And it was always, I was always glad to see them because I felt safe when they were around. But, you know, not that I ever felt really unsafe. Uh, you had to be careful because uh, Mongolians can be physical. They don't, they're, they're not any different than any other country in the world. When you're in a big city, there's some bad people. I mean, if you're in Washington, D.C., think about that. Think about going out walking around in, in Washington, D.C. Well, it's the same thing in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. you got pickpockets. you got everything out there. And, and, don't, and I did go out a few times at night, but not often. But anyway, uh, later on, I mean, I did go to uh, taught at the uh, Institute of Managerial Development, or IAMD, Institute for Administration and Managerial Development. It was a college and it was near the uh, uh, the the old officers building that we we had our pre-service training or where we stayed in the dorm but after I got it you stay with a, a, a family for two weeks I did that I stayed with a Mongolian family um, he uh, he had a factory and made uh, well I'll think of it in a minute uh, anyway it's a fabric made from goat hair, very famous. Cashmere, okay, they had a cashmere factory, and I got to go in there and see how cashmere was made. And of course, I stayed in their home, which had an iron door with bars and bars on every window. I mean, that tells you something. And uh, I was in, I slept in on a sofa in their living room, and uh, I must have gotten somebody's bed because when I'd go out in the mornings to go to, to teach or whatever I was gonna do that day, uh, there'd be a kid sleeping in the car outside, so I didn't feel too good about that, and I was glad to get out of there and uh, get my own apartment, which occurred in, oh, I guess that occurred in July. You know, you get your you get your own place. And then the, and then the rest of the volunteers scattered all over. I think there were only two or three that stayed in Ulaanbaatar. I was one of them. The rest of them went to different cities in, uh, in the country. And uh, some one guy, I can't remember his name, Real, he said he was a real outdoors type, and he wanted to go out and live in the steppe or in the countryside, and he did. And a few months later, he went nuts because you know it, it, it's tough out there, folks. You know when you got to get up in the morning and go chop ice to, and bring it in and thaw it out for drinking water, and you got to burn yak dung, shit, horse shit, for fuel because there's no wood or very little. Uh, it gets a little rough. Well, anyway, he thought he could handle that, and he found out he couldn't. Uh, the way they, he was throwing stuff at the Mongolians out the door of his uh, gear or his house, you know, their little tent-like thing, and they would come by to check on him. He'd throw shit at them. So anyway, they told the Peace Corps, and the Peace Corps sent some people out and got him and sent him back home. And after I'd been in country, I guess it was uh, November, I had a pain in my tooth, one of my teeth. Even though I'd had a complete dental checkup before I went in, you had to have that. And uh, they had a North Korean doctor take a look at it, and he drilled around in it and put some antibiotics in it. Still was very painful. And this thing's run on quite a ways, hadn't it? But it was still very painful. And uh, so anyway, with that, they sent me to uh, uh, Honolulu. I was in Honolulu for 45 days while they did a root canal. But what happened while I was in Honolulu, I got mugged. Okay, I got, I got, they left me for dead. That's where I got this scar. And uh, so anyway, that with those two things combined, uh, I was, if you're outside the country more than 30 days, you have to start over again. And I didn't want to go back and go through pre-service training and all that shit. So I, what they call ET, early terminated, came back to the States in, uh, I guess, December, into December. And uh, anyway, that was, that's my Peace Corps story. 
would I recommend it? Sure. You know, if you're if you're the if you're that kind of person, but you know, bear in mind it's not easy. Uh, the culture shock is real. I mean, you really do. You get off balance. Uh, it's uh, it's not for everybody. You know, you have to be prepared for isolation, and isolation means areas where you you may not hear your language. You know, in Mongolia, it's not a country. You know, like Beijing and China. You know, there, there's places you can go that, you know, they have English menus and so forth, and people speak a little English. Uh, Mongolia, it ain't happening, or it didn't then. It may now. But uh, so you just have to be aware of what you're getting into. With the Internet now, it'd be, it'd be much better because you could stay in touch with your family and friends. You know, back then I had to send letters, and you didn't know if anybody ever got them. You'd get a letter every now and then. Some stuff they sent for, to me I never got. So, you know. Uh, but that's all changed now. I, w I was there in the caveman days, and this is now we got the high tech, so it'd be totally different. But what isn't different is culture shock. That's still going to hit you. And are you going to get diarrhea? You betcha. You're going to get the you're going to get the shit out of it, and uh, because you're going to drink the water, and uh, you can't help it. You know, I boil water all the time. I, I mean, I boil gallons of water, and uh, still I, I get it. You know, and and the Peace Corps medical officer who I didn't have a lot of respect for and still don't. Uh, you know, oh, don't worry about it. You know, don't worry about it. Shit. You know, you're okay. If you're, you know, if you're only going five or six times a day, you're all right. Well, let me tell you, when I arrived in Honolulu, uh, I remember I went in, I weighed 209, 209. And when I arrived in Honolulu at the Queens Medical Center, that's where I stayed for 45 days in, in, on the island of Oahu uh, and got to see that island. But anyway, when I arrived in country, you know, I had never, I hadn't seen myself in a full, full length mirror in about seven or eight months. And uh, anyway, so I you know, I'd go into my room, and the first thing I want to do is take a good hot shower, and I did. I took a good hot shower, and when I came out on the inside of the bathroom door was a full-length mirror. Well, hell, I looked like a skeleton. I did. And uh, anyway, then I had to have a checkup the next day, and I did. I weighed 158. 158, okay? That's 51 pounds I lost. 51 pounds. That's 30% of my body weight, nearly, 30%. But did I feel bad? No. I mean, I, I could jump and hit my head on the ceiling, man. I'm telling you, uh, I had plenty of energy. I didn't feel bad at all, but one of the things I did real soon, I remember I went and got a, I got two, not one, two large pizzas, two large Pizza Hut pizzas on the island of Oahu, brought them back to my room, turned the TV on, had me some beer, and I don't know what all to drink, plenty. And I want you to know I proceeded to get shit-faced and full at the same time. I was just in heaven. I could hear English on TV. And be that as it may, that's enough of this. This thing's about 25 minutes or more long. I'll never, I'll never get it uploaded. But be that as it may, enjoy your life. And, uh, you know, if the Peace Corps for you younger folks, I mean, there was one lady in Ulaanbaatar that was in her uh, early 70s. You know, it, age doesn't matter. I mean, I turned 49 in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. So age doesn't matter. Health means a whole lot. you got to be fairly healthy because you're going to be hit by some bacteria. And do you, t you take a whole round of shots. I don't know how many shots we took. Probably 10, 12 different kinds of shots. And uh, so you got to get, get through that. But it is an experience. Will, will I ever forget it? No. Did I learn a lot there? Yes, I did. I learned that you don't need all the crap you have. Number one, when I came back, I had er everything I owned in the whole world, I had in one bag. That's it. I had gone from a five-bedroom house, three bath, with a Cadillac and a Suburban, a boat, a barn, on 10 acres of land. I had a swimming pool at one time. All that shit. I had it all. I mean, I was living the American dream. And then about... Eight years later, I'm coming back from Mongolia carrying one bag with all everything I owned in it. I mean, I'd left some stuff with my sister, not much, but some junk that I didn't even remember what it was. And uh, that's it. And, and from there, I have acquired very little. I mean, I, I nothing ain't bad. And uh, so but live your life, in my opinion. The less you have, the better you have. Because the more you have, it owns you. You don't own it. And they don't have storage buildings in Mongolia to put shit in so you can go get more shit. Anyway, I'll shut up now.
But anyway, that's my Peace Corps thing. I uh, hope you enjoy these videos. Again, my channel is Rusty78609. I'm retired. I, I'm always talking about the retired lifestyle and many other things. And uh, if you want to subscribe, do so. Uh, if you have a comment about this video, leave a comment. I'll make another video to answer it because somebody else might have the same question or comment. And uh, again, i uh, give you a thumbs up. You give me a thumbs up. So enjoy your day, folks. And uh, that's it for, and that's, that's it. So enjoy your day, folks. Adios. Bye-bye.